Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my talk on implicit coordination in multi-agent pathfinding. As some of you might know, I would have loved to come to South Africa this year and give my talk in person, but uh, well, it's uh, one of these things that uh, are not possible these days. And so I do the next best thing and will deliver my uh, talk remotely. Yeah, let me start uh, with an explanation of what I mean by implicit coordination. So when you have a multi-agent system, then you have apparently to coordinate between the agents and that can be done in an explicit way using communication and negotiation. Or one also can try to do it in an implicit way just by doing things and assuming that the other agents behave in a cooperative way and so then in the end, uh, everybody then converges on, uh, on satisfying the common goals. <clears throat> well, in a distributed multi-agent uh, planning system, this kind of implicit coordination comes up in a very natural way. So when planning, an agent has to assume that the other agents will fit in with their actions. And uh, then the planning agent has to take the perspective of the other agents and plan also from their perspective and hope that they then also will act according to this plan or in a very similar way. Let me give you an example. Um, it is a common situation when you have a household robot that uh, you want to do something. And of course, you want also the uh, robot to help you. So here we have a situation where we have um, the master who wants to um, <clears throat> who wants to hang up a picture on the wall, and he states this this goal. And of course, the robot then adapts this goal and uh, wants to help the um, human. Uh, and that is actually what um, the um, the human intends to do here. He wants. Uh, that the uh, robot fetches the hammer in order to bring it to the human so that he can fasten the, the picture to the wall. But uh, why does he, why does the human assume that the robot will come to help? Well, it is because the human knows that the robot knows from, uh, from the situation here that the human needs a hammer and that he doesn't have a hammer in, in this situation. And so because um, of uh, this situation and also the goal that the um, uh, human wants to put the, uh, the picture of the wall, well, he will bring the hammer in order to help the human. So that might sound a little bit artificial to you, but I have a very similar example, which uh, came up in, a, in an um, experiment by Tomasello, and well, let me show it to you what's happening. Oh! Hmm. Oh! Hmm. And this is pretty amazing. So? So what you saw there was that uh, this kit uh, did recognize the goal of the human and it also then uh, saw that it cannot achieve the goal because his hands were full and he were, were not able, he was not able to, to open the door. Then he adopted this goal as its own goal. And then there was this um, little thing of implicit coordination where the uh, where the kit came in order to open the door and then looked at um, the, um, the adult uh, for completing then the task of uh, putting the stuff he wants to, uh, wanted to put in the, uh, in the cupboard uh, there. Um, we will study this in a more simplified uh, environment, namely when we just have mobile agents and mobile agents they come up very naturally uh, in many applications uh, 
where you then have to implement coordinated movements of such agents, robots or vehicles. And here we see an example where we have uh, uh, logistics robots that uh, we developed uh, together with, uh, with others. And what you see is, well, they, one of the main things is that they don't collide. And well, the, the plan of the talk now is to study this implicit coordination technique in the context of mobile agents, um, where each agent wants to reach a destination. And um, this problem, having a set of mobile agents that each want to, to reach a destination, this is what is also called multi-agent pathfinding. So when you abstract all the physical things away, then what you get is you get this uh, rather abstract multi-agent pathfinding problem, which can be defined as follows. You have a set of agents, A, you have an undirected simple graph, G. You have an initial state modeled by an injective function that maps agents to nodes. And you have a goal state that is modeled by another injective function uh, mapping agents to nodes. And what you uh, want to generate is a sequence of movements that transforms the initial state into a gold state by single movements of agents um, uh, without collisions. Okay, let me give you an example. Here we have two agents, a square one and a circle one, and they want to reach their, um, their destination. So the square one wants to go to B3 and the uh, circular one wants to go to B2. Now, uh, can we find a central plan that moves the square robot S to B3 and the circle robot C to B2? Well, it, that's not very difficult. So first of all, we start to plan for the circle robot to go to V2. And now he has reached its destination. Um, well, but it also is now an obstacle for the square robot because the square robot still wants to go to V3 but cannot without colliding. And so first of all, this circle robot has to go out of the way. Then the square robot plans to go to V3 and arrives there and finally the circular robot goes back and now they are all happy because they all have reached their destination. Well, that is a well-studied problem. Um, and um, this particular problem and a number of variants have been analyzed extensively. There have been uh, a number of algorithms that have been developed well already in 84. Kornhauser, Miller, and Spirakis came up uh, with a solution that uh, uh, guarantees that we will have only cubically many movement actions. Um, and then there was a little bit later then also a proof that if we want to find optimal plans, shortest plans, then this is an NP-complete problem. And by now we have a number of different optimal and suboptimal algorithms that have been designed to solve MAPF and a number of variants. Okay, so what do we want to add to that? Well, what we want to add is that uh, we want to have distributed planning. So all agents um, have the same knowledge about the environment, so they know where they can go. And then they also know the position of all the other robots and of their destinations. Now, uh, we don't have a central instance any longer that generates a plan and then distributes the plan to the agents, but each agent generates a sequential plan containing own actions uh, and actions by others. So what we have there is we have an implicitly coordinated plan for each agent that plans for all the others. And then, of course, these plans have to be executed. And in order to execute them, what we do is uh, we always choose one agent. And that should be an agent that wants to act, that is, has as its first action an own movement. And then uh, this action is executed. Uh, and after that, the eight, there might be agents that have not anticipated the action and then they need to come up with a new plan or the others they can work with a, uh, with a plan they already have made and just remove the first action in the plan. 
Okay. Well, the good news uh, is that uh, when you follow such a protocol, then agents never end up in a dead end. So, uh, well, the reason for that is that if each agent follows a valid plan, then although they might not have anticipated actions of the other agents, uh, it will never be the case that they uh, reach a state from which they cannot recover. Okay, now the big question is, can there also go something wrong? And this is indeed the case. So um, what can happen is uh, that agents uh, could be lazy. What does it mean? Well, that means that sometimes they choose a plan, they generate a plan where they expect that another agent should act, although they themselves could act. And a good example for such plans, for such lazy plans are um, the dishwashing dilemma in which then the agents might wait forever. So what's the dishwashing dilemma? Well, you probably have experienced that by yourself when you had a nice meal with your partner at home. And then, well, you have to make a plan that somebody has to put uh, in the dishes into the dishwasher. And of course, uh, it is um, um, possible that each of you make a plan where the other puts the um, dishes into the dishwasher. And that means, well, that nobody will act at all. And um, the agents will wait forever uh, to, that the other one starts to do something. Okay, what can you do against that? Well, you can require that agents should be eager. That is, um, agents uh, should act or should generate a plan um, without creating a cycle and uh, or a dead end in the plan. Well, uh, <clears throat> if they uh, come up with a valid plan, then they should try to, to come up with a valid plan where they act first. And so we will never have this situation that um, all the agents wait for each other forever. And that means actually uh, deadlocks can be avoided or are avoided. Um, but there is another problem then. And this problem can be uh, shown uh, by this example here, where we have, again, these two agents and the uh, circular agent wants to go to B2, the square agent wants to go to B6. And now let's see what, what they are doing. They make up a plan, each one. And S makes a plan where he wants to move this way. And uh, this circular robot makes a plan to go up here. Okay, so what's happening then? Well, the square robot starts to act and goes to V3. And uh, well, the circular robot does not replan, but just follow its plan. And um, now um, the uh, square robot, well, he's impressed by, by the fact that the circular agent also went back here. And so he goes now back to this uh, in order to go this way around. Now the circular robot also replans and replans also to go the other way around. Well, that looks stupid, but uh, well, it is uh, an eager agent and he always comes up with a plan uh, where he believes the other agent might do uh, things in the way he wants to do it. Uh, and so uh, by going back, he might uh, uh, think that, uh, well, the square robot might still then go this way around. And in any case, so what we experience here is that we are back to start. So what we have done, uh, although we uh, have not generated any uh, cyclic plan, what, but what we do is we have a cyclic um, execution. And this is something, well, we don't want to do because then we cannot guarantee that we uh, um, um, terminate. Well, but what we can do is, uh, well, we can put on um, the requirement that agents should be eager. We could also um, put um, there another requirement, namely that they should plan optimally. And this uh, then actually removes the problem we have seen in the example before. So optimally eager agents are agents that plan to act first but only if this is an optimal plan. 
And uh, with this, then we can guarantee that infinite executions are impossible. So uh, what you probably will experience is that uh, the agents come not up with the same plan, but all the plans uh, they come up with have the same length because they all should be optimal. And what you also can guarantee that at least one agent wants to act because all of the agents are eager. And uh, well, that means that uh, after we have chosen one of the agents to act, then after the executed action, the length will be decremented by one. And that means when they now replan or use the, um, uh, the old plan as it was, uh, we will have a plan that is one step uh, shorter. And so we have a guarantee that uh, this will converge then to zero and all the agents can reach their destinations. Okay. So that's the way uh, to go. What we have uh, shown is, so it is possible to be successful when you have an implicitly coordinated multi-agent uh, pathfinding problem um, by uh, when, when you have full observation and when you can plan optimally. Um, Okay, the only problem is that in order to, to do that, uh, well, the agents have to solve a sequence of NP hard problems. Uh, and that's not so nice because, well, every time we have to replan, well, we have to come up with another, um, with another optimal plan, which is an NP hard problem. Okay, can you do something to avoid that? Well, um, you can, instead of having um, um, optimal planners, you can use what I call conservative agents. So conservative agents are those that replan from the initial state, from the original and initial state, including the already executed action as a plan prefix. And um, this is something that is very similar to taboo search. So what you uh, do by that is, well, when you plan, you say, well, I never want to plan uh, for a cycle. And because I remember what I have done, I will never ever create a plan that contains a cycle. So I can guarantee that in the end, um, we will be successful. And indeed, conservative, conservative eager agents are guaranteed to be successful because they cannot run into infinite cycles by design. But now what can happen is conservative eager agents might explore the entire state space and this state space might be exponentially uh, large. Um, and uh, here we have a very simple example where we have N agents, the squares here, and they all want to go down to, to, their, to their destinations. But then what's happening is if all the agents are eager, then they, uh, after another agent has moved, they probably will go back, well, because they, they want to act and uh, they don't care whether they move away from their destination or not. And so um, if um, um, the execution order is chosen corresponding to a bit change of a gray counter, then you actually can visit the entire state space. And uh, well, as I said, that's exponentially large. And in this case here, it's uh, two to the n, right? So um, we can solve the um, implicit coordination problem in uh, multi-agent pathfinding either by um, optimizing or by, um, by accepting that uh, we then also might have um, uh, memory that uh, has to be exponentially large. Both things are not good, but uh, I would prefer actually to to uh, solve NP complete problems instead of remembering exponentially many things. Now let's do something that uh, is even more challenging. And that is that uh, we introduce destination uncertainty. Okay, what does it mean? That means that um, all agents know their own destinations, but the destinations of the agents are not common knowledge any longer. And um, so what we will assume is that uh, for each agent, there exists a set of possible destinations and the set of possible destinations is now the common knowledge. So we don't know any longer 
whether agent S wants to go to a particular node, B3, but we only have now a set of um, possible destinations. The common goal of all agents is still that everybody reaches its destination. And also we have full observability of all the movements and obstacles and whatnot. Um, what we also need uh, is uh, what uh, we call a shutdown action. And this shutdown action um, that uh, signals that an agent has reached its um, destination and doesn't want to leave the destination anymore. And this is needed in order to make it possible for the last agent um, th that moves um, here to be sure that everybody has reached its goal. Otherwise, he, he wouldn't know that, uh, um, that uh, the, the common goal has been reached. And well, the whole setting uh, looks like uh, multi-robot interaction without communication and only by observing what the other agents do, we will um, come then in the end to the conclusion that we have, have reached the goal. Okay, let me give you a very small example. We have again the square agent and the circle agents agent and uh, the square agent wants to go to B3 and knows about the circle agent that it wants to go to B1 or V4. Okay, and similarly, the uh, circle agent wants to go to V4, but uh, uh, knows about the square agent that uh, it wants to go to V2 and uh, B3. Well, I have uh, tried to to uh, describe the setting by using hollow circles and uh, squares and uh, filled circles and squares and the filled symbols, they represent the real destination and the others are just possible destinations. But uh, okay, so now let's assume that again, we want to, want to generate um, implicitly coordinated plans. And that means, uh, well, when S starts to form a plan in which it moves, then it will try to empower the other agent to reach the common goal. What does that mean? Well, that means that um, if, um, if S wants to plan, it needs to shift the perspective in order to plan for all the possible destinations of C. So he doesn't know where C wants to go. So he plans for both of the destinations and does that from the perspective of C. Uh, well, that also means that um, when he plans for C, S must forget about its own destination because well, C doesn't know the destinations of S. That sounds a little bit complicated, but will become clear. Uh, in a minute. So um, first of all, let me explain what kind of building blocks we have now in our branching plans. Well, we have the moving actions as before. Then we have the shutdown action. That means, well, we don't want to move any longer. So we power our motor down. Then we have the perspective shift, which is just a virtual action, but uh, means that from now on, we uh, plan from the perspective of the other agent. And then we have a branching on all destinations after a perspective shift. And that means that now we have to look at all the possible destinations of the other agents and make a plan for, for the possible destinations. And finally, we might also have an unconditional continuation after a perspective shift. That is, well, we uh, make a perspective shift but well, we, we, make a, we make one plan for all possible destinations. Okay. And then we arrive at structures that look like that, trees or branching plants, where we start, for example, here uh, for the square agents moving from V1 to V4. So we go down here and then we make a perspective shift to C and depending on whether C wants to go to a V1 or V4, we make uh, different plans. And here it looks like, uh, well, we make different plans, but the first action is the same for C. It moves uh, from V2 uh, to V1. 
Uh, but here then, uh, if V1 was the real destination, we make a shutdown action. And uh, here we make another uh, perspective shift for uh, to, to S. And if we had made here the uh, shutdown action for C, then only S has to finalize now the plan. So we again then uh, change the perspective to S and depending on what the uh, real destination is, we do different things. Okay, should be clear what's what's going on here, right? And um, this is uh, indeed a valid plan for this situation here. Well, if you want to have it on a more general level, then uh, what we came up with is the notion of so-called strong plans uh, or I-strong plans. And this is um, similar to strong plans in non-deterministic single agent planning. And these I-strong plans for an I agent I, they have to be cycle-free. So they should not visit the same objective state uh, twice. Um, and well, that means that um, Objective means that the agent configuration and the common beliefs um, are the same. So that shouldn't happen because then we again are in a cycle and uh, uh, might end up in an infinite uh, execution. Uh, furthermore, these plans should be always successful. That is, they should always end up in a state such that all agents have been shut down, have arrived at their destinations. And they also should be covering, that is for all combinations of possible destinations of agents, different from the agent I, a shutdown state uh, can be reached. For the agent I, it's different. Uh, that's enough if we uh, reach one, uh, namely the original um, uh, destination. Now, if there is an I strong plan, then the instance is called I solvable. Um, now we have to distinguish between subjectively and objectively strong plans. So a plan is called subjectively strong if it's I strong for some agent I, and a plan is called objectively strong if it is I strong for each agent I. So a plan where which can be given to any of the agents uh, and it's I strong for them, then it's objectively strong, uh, otherwise it's subjectively strong. And we also say that an instance is objectively or subjectively solvable if there exists an, uh, exist an objectively or subjectively strong plan. Um, the difference will become clear in a moment when we look at an example, namely this one here. So what's going on here? Um, the square agent wants to go to V1, this uh, circular agent wants to go to V2, and the um, uh, triangle agent wants to go to V3. So if all the um, destinations were known to everybody, then we would have a very short plan. Well, everybody just went to their destination and then it, everything is good. Okay, but now we don't have that. And the question is, can we come up uh, with, uh, with successful, with strong plans? And here the, the square agent, uh, the square agent can come up with a strong, with an I strong plan for itself. And uh, well, why is it so? Well, the reason is, well, he just moves to its destination. And uh, after that, it sees that uh, for the remaining agent, things are easy because, well, if the circular agent as this destination here just went there. And after that, the triangle can move freely. And uh, if the circular agent has this place here, then it just went, uh, can go there. And the triangle agent also can go to both of its possible destination. So here they, we have a um, subjectively strong plan for the square agent. Because uh, of symmetry, we also have one for the circular agent. But do we also have a subjectively strong plan for the triangle agent? Um, no, we don't have because, uh, well, it could be the case that uh, the square agent wants to go to V4 and the circular agent wants to go V2 and the triangle agent cannot help 
these agents um, uh, because, well, they necessarily have to collide. So he doesn't know what to do. And um, he cannot come up with a um, subjectively strong plan at all. Okay, so there's no T strong plan for the triangle agent, but an S strong and a C strong plan. Okay, so when you look at these plans uh, from a more general perspective, then the question is, um, when can we sort of guarantee that these plans exist? Or can we say anything about these plans? And um, indeed, what we can find in these plans are so-called stepping stones. And we call a stepping stone for agent I, um, we call a state a stepping stone for agent I, in which I can move to each of its possible destinations uh, without uh, interfering with other agents, then shutting down. And afterwards, for each possible destination, the resulting instance is I solvable. So, uh, Regardless of where the other agents wants to go, um, we uh, they they can find a plan to do so. And giving you an example here, um, S can create a stepping stone for C. So the square here can by moving from V1 to V4 um, and then to V3. So it can go down here. And this is a stepping stone. Why is it so? because now the circular agent can move to V4 or V1 to both of its destination and afterwards where well, the square agent can do the rest. So um, it can move to either V1 or V4 and then shut down. Um, and now in each of the cases here, S can move afterwards to its destination and uh, or stay there and shut down. Okay, so um, there you saw what a stepping stone can do. Well, a stepping stone actually means that uh, from there on, we can reduce the problem to easier problems. Um, an interesting fact about these stepping stones is that if you have an I-solvable um, instance, then there exists an I-strong branching plan such that only branching points such that the only branching points are those utilizing stepping stones. And uh, well, the idea is that um, what you can do is you can remove safely non-stepping stone branching points by picking one branch that uh, doesn't end in a shutdown action. Uh, and I'll give you a proof by example. Um, so here we have the branching plan again that I showed you before. And now uh, look at what's happening here. So we have a branching point where after the perspective shift to C, we branch for the um, destination V1 and V4. Neither of them ends in a shutdown state. No, this one ends in a shutdown state here. Um, this one doesn't. And so what we can do is we can choose this, uh, um, this branch because we know that further down in the tree, we will handle the different um, situations for, for the agent C again, and we'll make sure that C arrives at all possible destinations. Okay, that means, well, we uh, uh, cut that off, this branch, and we don't branch anymore here at that point and then continue with this plan. And this plan must also be a valid plan as I have argued. And so that means that um, the only remaining branching uh, points in, in the branching plan are those where we, um, uh, have an, uh, uh, where we have a stepping stone. So when you now think about um, the execution cost of these branching plans, then well, you can come up with different uh, cost measures but uh, well, the most reasonable one is the one where you say it's the number of atomic actions, no virtual actions, of the longest execution traced. And from that then it follows that uh, if we have an isolvable instance over some graph, then there exists an I-strong branching plan with execution cost that is bounded 
by the order of uh, number of uh, nodes to the power of four. Why is that so? Well, that is a direct consequence of the stepping stone theorem and the maximal number of movements in the original uh, multi-agent pathfinding problem. Well, because of the stepping stone theorem, it means that we can only have as many um, uh, branching points on top of each other as there are agents. And this is um, upper bounded by the number of um, vertices. And then, well, we know that um, um, the uh, maximal number of movements that are necessary to solve a multi-agent pathfinding problem is cubic in the number of vertices. Okay, so that is great. Um, unfortunately, when we now try to uh, generalize the positive result about optimal eager agents to the, from the fully observable case uh, to this uh, only partially observable case, then it turns out it doesn't generalize because we don't have uniform knowledge any longer. Um, and it really is the case, we have examples for that that are a little bit complicated but uh, they demonstrate that indeed execution cycles can happen if we don't have common knowledge. Uh, but what we can again try to do is we uh, employ conservatism. And uh, so when we put together optimal eagerness and conservatism, then it turns out that uh, for solvable instances, joint execution and replanning by conservative optimally eager agents is always successful and the execution cost can also be bounded by a polynomial. And well, there, that is the reason, well, we had to um, uh, use optimally here in order to bound the length of the execution. Because as I said before, if we are only conservative and eager, then we can be forced to visit the entire state space. And the proof idea here is that um, after the second agent starts to act, all agents then all of a sudden have an identical perspective. And for this reason, produce all I strong plans with the same execution costs. And then these can be shown to be bounded polynomially using the stepping stone theorem. But if you look at the cost of generating such um, short plans, then it turns out that uh, unfortunately, um, this uh, the um, uh, decision problem corresponding to the optimization problem is um, p-space complete. And the easy part here is um, the uh, membership in p-space that uh, is a consequence of the fact that all the traces in the um, in the, uh, in the branching plan uh, have only polynomially, uh, polynomial depth. And the hardness can be done using a reduction from QBF. And here I have a simple example where you can construct a graph and a setting of the agents that shows that you actually can evaluate uh, QBF formulae with, uh, uh, with that. Okay, that is bad, but of course, uh, when you look at special cases, like um, when you have only a fixed number of agents, then things are a bit better um, because, well, we were able to show that for a fixed number C of agents, deciding whether they exist in um, uh, map FDU I strong or objectively strong plan with execution costs of K or less, this can be done in time uh, O of n to the power of uh, c squared plus c, whereby n is the number of nodes. Well, that means, for example, that for uh, two agents, it takes only uh, n to the power of six time. But uh, well, actually, in practice, uh, that should be uh, that should be faster. Yeah, let me come to a summary. Uh, I hope to have convinced you that implicit coordination is a very powerful coordination technique that has its price. Uh, I uh, showed you that uh, one can generalize the uh, multi-agent pathfinding problem to the multi-agent pathfinding problem with destination uncertainty. And uh, the generalization is that you drop the assumption that plans can be communicated and that destinations are common knowledge. 
and if you drop these both assumptions, then it is still possible to uh, guarantee that joint execution of implicitly coordinated plans will be successful, provided you have agents that are conservative and optimally eager. Um, unfortunately, it's the case that um, bounded plan existence is P-space complete, which means that uh, the, uh, that the uh, optimization problem is then FP-space complete. And it's polynomial for a fixed number of agents. Well, if you want to have a nice take home message, then uh, take home message one is implicit coordination works in multi-agent pathfinding problem with destination uncertainty and in other um, contexts. And another take home message is if it's possible to communicate, then do it. It can save you an awful lot of hassle, which means in our case, an awful loot of, uh, of, awful loot of computation. Because, well, if you can communicate, then you can use a central instance for planning, and then you can actually solve the problem in polynomial time and communicate it. If you are not able to do that, then you need necessarily P space. Okay, that was my summary. There are a number of interesting um, open questions. Uh, one is, well, all the results were for general undirected graphs only. And the question is, do they also hold for planar graphs or for directed graphs? And one interesting open problem we haven't solved is, is it also possible to show that P-space hard, uh, to show that solvability is P-space hard? And um, then an, another interesting question is, how would more general forms of describing common knowledge about destinations affect the results? So for example, when you have overlapping destinations or general Boolean combinations of destination statements. Then another question is, can we get similar results for other execution semantics, for example, for concurrent executions of actions? But in this context, also it's not completely clear any longer what implicit coordination means. And then is, uh, there's a question whether we could be more aggressive in expectation about possible destinations. And here the idea would be to use forward induction. Uh, that means that we assume that actions in the past were rational. That's something we do not take into account yet. We only look into the future when we uh, replan. And then there's also the question of whether other forms of implicit coordination, of whether the other forms of implicit coordination, such as coordination in competitive scenarios. Okay, and uh, with that, I'm uh, done and I'm open for questions. Thank you.